And hello everyone, welcome to Worship with West Concord as we gather online together again. So good to have you and so glad that you're able to be with us. We have finished our series on Malachi, talking about coming back from captivity. For the last couple of sessions, we looked at some uh, scriptures concerning peace and rest. And then I was away for a week and I want to say a special thank you to Richard Reed, our senior adult pastor for filling in for me and doing such an outstanding job. You know, it's wonderful to know that you have such a great ministry team here at West Concord that uh, I can be gone and leave everything in good hands. So again, thank you, Richard, for doing such a great job. You know, we're going to talk about transformation over the next few weeks, and we're going to look at 1 Peter to do that. Peter was saved under Jesus' ministry, of course. He was one of the original apostles. And as Peter began his ministry, uh, he had to grow. There was a lot of growth. If you remember, Peter denied Christ in the garden after Jesus was betrayed. He denied knowing him, and uh, he grieved over that. And finally, the risen Lord sort of returned him back to fellowship again. And then Peter, after Jesus had ascended into heaven, began in a halting sort of way his ministry. And it's wonderful to look at the life of Peter because you see in Peter's life his spiritual journey as he grew from a spiritual babe to the leader or a leader of the Christian church and a great evangelist and a great preacher. And so we're going to look for the next few weeks at the book of 1 Peter. And I've entitled this God's Handbook for Sojourners. Because as we've been talking about transformation, as we're going to look at Peter, and we have just mentioned his transformation Transformation is a journey. It's a process. And as we go through life, we go through this journey. Every day is another start on the journey to grow closer to Christ and become more like Him. And it's a tough journey. I mean, we're living in a difficult world, more so now than ever for our generation, uh, dealing with a virus, dealing with unrest, dealing with political uh, fights and so forth. This is, this is a difficult world we're trying to navigate and so it's necessary that as we seek to still try to be transformed by God, that we have a guide in this journey. And so God has provided us, yes, the entire Bible as his guidebook, but it seems Peter goes out of his way to help Christian sojourners with information on how to navigate this world as they seek to be transformed into the image of Christ. What is a sojourner? A sojourner is a temporary dweller. It's almost like somebody visiting another part of the world or another country. Uh, if you go on vacation, say, to Europe or to South America, you're a sojourner there for a little while. That's not your home. In a sense, you're an alien to that place, and you're not expected to stay. You know, when we got saved and became Christians, our citizenship changed. We are no longer citizens of this world. We're no longer primarily citizens of the United States or whatever country you're listening to this in, but we have now become citizens of the kingdom of God. And our allegiance to that needs to abound. And so we're just sojourners here. We're just, in a sense, aliens in this world, making our way through until Christ calls us home. So how do we do that? And how do we use that to transform and allow God to transform us into Christ's image? I love what Ravi Zacharias said. And Ravi Zacharias, he went home to be with the Lord earlier this year. And uh, what a loss to the church of Jesus Christ. He was a man of tremendous wisdom and grace. And he said this about the journey of transformation. He said, in a very real sense, part of the journey of transformation in a believer's life is becoming aware of our false expectations and the true nature of the world we have to live in and face which the Bible reminds us is still afflicted by dark and powerful forces. And he makes reference to Ephesians 6. He goes on to say that throughout our lives and our journey, we are compelled to ask questions of our beliefs or our values and our experiences. You know, again, he likens that transformative power of God, that transformative act of God as a journey. And as we go through this journey, we're often challenged. We're often uh, met with difficulties. And sometimes it causes us to look at our convictions, to ask ourselves, is what I think is important really important? We're often asked to look at our lives. And even sometimes we bring up those questions concerning 
our beliefs and, and our faith. Is God real? Does God care? Is He active in my life and in this world? What is going on? Well, that's part of the journey. And that's why it is a journey. It's a process. Zechariah goes on to say in the rest of this quote, he says, perhaps the question is, how, how does God work in forming us and transforming us? Do these experiences of pressure, suffering, and doubt actually contribute to our growth? And more, are they in reality part of the ways and means employed by God to achieve these ends or to achieve His ends? In other words, does God allow difficulty on the journey to help us to grow, to help us to transform? Are the challenges that we face, the obstacles that we meet, are, are all these things part of God's plan to mold us, to shape us, and to form us into something new and better? Again, you have to ask yourself that because otherwise, why would God, a loving and good God, allow us to go through difficulties in life? Why would He allow us to go through financial difficulties? Why would He allow to, us to go through physical infirmities? Why would He allow us to go through a pandemic? Because He wants to change us. He wants to transform us. And I want you to notice the underlying passage. We've quoted this several times over the last few months. And it is a passage, I'll be honest and transparent, that's helped carry me through these difficult times. And in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, listen, if you don't have it memorized, I want to encourage you to memorize it. It says this. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will make your paths straight. You know, that's a promise for life. And that's a promise for the journey of life. As we sojourn in this world and as we walk along the paths that God has laid out before us. And yes, sometimes those paths are easy. Sometimes they're difficult. Sometimes they're smooth. Sometimes they're rocky. Sometimes they're, they're straight and sometimes they're winding. Sometimes there are hills. And sometimes there are valleys. And so here we are walking through this journey and seeking to trust the Lord. And that's what we need to learn from the book of 1 Peter. We need to learn how to navigate and maneuver in that journey so that we continue to draw close to the Lord and allow Him to change us, make us new, and make us better. And so that's why I've called the book of 1 Peter God's handbook for sojourners because this is no longer our world. We're aliens in this world. We're visitors to this world. We're just passing through, as the old spiritual says. And one day God is either going to blow us trumpet or one day we'll get sick and pass and we'll go on home. But until then, we're here. How do we make it? How do we get through it? Where's the guidance for this journey? That's what we're going to see in the book of 1 Peter. So let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of meeting today. Thank you for these who have joined us online, Father. And I pray in Jesus' name as we open your word this morning that truly you would begin to give us guidance and leadership on this journey as we who are sojourners in this world, temporary visitors, aliens, if you will, Lord. This is no longer our home. Our home is in heaven. This is no longer our country. Our country is the kingdom of Almighty God. And so, Father, help us as resident aliens, as sojourners, to find guidance and help as we forward our way through. Give us strength, give us peace, give us grace for this journey, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of 1 Peter. And today what we're going to do is we're going to give a, an overview of 1 Peter. We're going to look at the entire book and sort of get the themes and get the, get the gist of the message so that as the weeks go by and we delve into it deeper, we'll sort of have a base to be able to work with. But I want you to notice four things as we look at the book of 1 Peter this morning. Four themes that we're going to pull out of these scriptures. And as we open chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, we're going to look at the sojourner's reality. What is the reality of the situation we're in? You know, oftentimes we want to come up with a spiritual fantasy or we want to look at the world the way we would like to see it. But what Peter wants us to do and what God through Peter wants us to do is to look at the world the way it really is and to look at our relationship with the world 
the way it really is. And I want you to notice two things here as we look at this scripture. First of all, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. First Peter chapter 1, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1, it says this. And Peter is opening the letter. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is simply one who is sent with a commission. And his commission was to bring the gospel to the lost. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and this is an interesting word, to the pilgrims of the dispersion, and he goes on to name some countries, but who are the pilgrims? When we think of a pilgrim, we think of somebody at Thanksgiving who lived 400 years ago with a black hat and a buckle on it eating turkey. But a pilgrim is somebody who is basically a sojourner. Actually, the Greek word here literally means an alien, a visitor, and that's how God sees His people in this world. We are now no longer of the world. We're in the world. We live here. I mean, we, we interact with the people. We go to work. We go to school. We, we go to Walmart. Whatever it is we do, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. We are pilgrims or strangers. He then lists the nations. He says, who are in dispersion. What is he talking about? Well, a lot of the Christians, especially Jewish Christians, at one time were, were sent out from Rome. They were no longer allowed by the emperor to live in Rome. And so the Jews in Rome were dispersed or sent out all over the Roman Empire. They no longer wanted them there. They're, the Romans were very anti-Semitic. And so they sent them out. And so these Jews, and, and specifically Jewish Christians, were all over the place. And Peter addresses some of the different provinces that were in Asia Minor, or what is today modern Turkey. He says they are dispersed in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now these are cities that... We don't really have the names today of these cities, but they're in that, in that vicinity of what is today modern-day Turkey and a little bit east of Turkey. So basically in the Middle East, and that is where Peter was directing this letter to the churches and the communities there. Those believers who had come to know Christ, and a lot of them were Jewish believers who were, who were dispersed. And listen, they not only dispersed the Jews, but because at that time Christianity was so linked to Judaism that they also dispersed many of the Christians as well. So they were out, they were all over the place, and so they were not only pilgrims and strangers and sojourners in this world because of Christ, but they were also going to strange places as well. He goes on to say, elect, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification or setting apart of the Holy Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, Grace to you and peace be multiplied. So these people, these Christians that Peter is writing to, they are in the world. They are dispersed throughout the known Roman Empire at the time. But yet they are not of the world. These were God's children. These were saved people, chosen because of their faith. The Bible tells us that God chooses those who believe to be saved. He doesn't choose individuals, but He chooses on the basis of belief. 1 Corinthians 1.21 says it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And so God has chosen to save believers. And so they've been chosen by the foreknowledge of God. God has a plan. Sanctified or set apart by the Spirit of God for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. These are God's people. Again, understand, these are no longer citizens of this world in a real sense, in a spiritual sense. Yes, I am an American. I was raised in America. I love America. I love our country. But I am now, since I've become a Christian over the last 40 years, I am now and have been a citizen of heaven. And quite frankly, I'm a citizen of heaven first. Heaven now has my full allegiance. That is my, now my country. I'm still loving America. I still stand for America. I will fight for America. But first and foremost, I am a Christian. And I stand for the kingdom of God first and foremost. And so my citizenship is now there. Paul says this elsewhere in his letters. Our citizenship is now in heaven. Yes, we are in the world. We go to work. We go to school. We go to the store. We meet with family and friends. We are living in this world. God didn't mean for us to sit up on a mountain or a high tower and hide. No, no, we're to be in the world. And sure enough, God dispersed these believers throughout the world so that they might be a, a, a conduit of the gospel to other people in the world. 
But at the same time, while we're in the world and we're Americans or we're Japanese or we're Mexicans or whatever nationality we claim, as believers, we are not of the world. We're not to live like the world, adopt the world's cultures. We are not to adopt the world's values. We are to be the children of God. And so sojourners, understand this, as we look at this, this is our reality. We are in the world, but not of the world. As soon as we understand that concept, it makes the rest of the book of 1 Peter easier to understand and easier to apply. So the sojourner's reality, the reality for the believer is you and I are resident aliens. This is not our home. Our home now is in heaven. Do you know why you walk around sometimes even when life is good? You feel a little bit discouraged. You feel a little bit down. Uh, you might feel a little strange. It's because you're homesick for something better. And that is our home in heaven. So we're in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. We're supposed to be of the kingdom of God. So let's look at the sojourner's desire. You see, because if we have a, another citizenship, if we have another country, we desire that country. I know many years ago when several of us from church went to central Mexico for a mission trip, man, the people down there were wonderful. The land was, was very beautiful, and we enjoyed ourselves. It was tough, but I think to each man, each woman that went there, we were really longing after a while to be back home. There's something about home that makes us long for something different, something better. And so what is the sojourner's desire? What is our desire? Well, go to chapter 2. Let's look at chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up in verse 1. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, look with me in verse 1. It says this, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. So as we have changed our citizenship, we're in the world but not of the world. Therefore, there needs to be a new desire on our behalf for something better in our lives. In other words, there needs to be some sort of exchange. There needs to be something that is put aside and something that is picked up. There needs to be something that is renounced and then there needs to be something that is received. So what are we to renounce? What should, we, what should we not desire? Well, he said, we need to therefore lay aside the characteristics of the worldly. In other words, malice, you know, speaking of people with evil intent. Man, I tell you, you go on Facebook, you go on Twitter, uh, all these things, and it's just getting more hateful, more contentious, more mean, even between Christians. Brothers and sisters in Christ fighting and arguing with one another. We need to lay aside that, that malice, that evil intent when we speak. Also, deceit. We need to quit living lives and telling lies. Hypocrisy. We need to be what we are and who we are. We often want to play the hypocrite. As a matter of fact, the Greek word hypocrisy literally means someone who is an actor, someone who is playing a part. He talks about envy, another thing that is a problem with social media. Because whenever you look at it, somebody else seems to have a better life than you. Oh, you're having a difficult time, but they're in the beach having a good time. Or you might be eating a bowl of Cheerios, but they're out there at their family eating eggs and bacon and all these things. And so we tend to compare and we begin to envy. We need to lay that aside. And also all evil speaking. If, it didn't, if, it, if that didn't cover it, then I don't know what does. It almost says, listen, you might want to get off Facebook. You might want to get off Twitter for a while if that's a problem. As believers in Jesus Christ, we need to live that way and we need to desire to be loving, kind, gracious. And so we need to lay these things aside. We need to renounce these things. And look at verse 2. What should we receive? Well, as newborn babes, born into God's kingdom, desire this. Here's our desire. The pure milk of the word. You know, do you have a desire for the basic truths of God's Word? That's what he's talking about when he's talking about the pure milk of the Word, especially if you're a new believer. You know, uh, a newborn baby, they drink milk. They, mother's milk formula, whatever, they have milk, and it provides the basic nutrients they need to be healthy and grow strong. God has provided those nutrients in His Word. But how often do we leave the Bible closed and on our shelves? And how often off does that Bible collect dust? 
and we very rarely pick it up. He says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the world, word, that you may grow thereby. That you may grow thereby. Again, transformation is a process. Transformation is a journey. Just like life is a journey. We start off as babies. We grow into toddlers, children, teenagers, young adults, and then middle-aged, and then older. And we keep going. It's a journey. And that is a journey of transformation. So we should, we should renounce the things of the world and we should pick up or receive the truths of God. And he goes on to finish this little statement by saying, listen, you need to do this if indeed, verse 3, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And, he, and listen, if you know Jesus as your Savior, if you've trusted Him and He saved you and God's Spirit has come into dwell, then you know He is gracious. Of course you've tasted that He is gracious and that He is good. So if we're going to have that desire that we should have, you know, just like a, a traveler, while they're enjoying the place that they're visiting and they're involved in whatever adventure they're, they're involved in, there's always that longing, that homesickness. They desire something better, something greater. We need to lay aside the, the, the evil characteristics of this world and we need to receive the goodness of God's Word and God's truth. So, the sojourner's reality, we're in the world, we're not of it. The sojourner's desire, we are to renounce some things and receive the true living Word of God. And so let's look at the third aspect, the sojourner's attitude. So what kind of attitude are we to have as we are visitors in this world? Well, I want you to notice a couple things. Go to chapter 3 with me. Take your Bibles and go to 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, we're going to look at what our attitude should be here. And again, our attitude, how we think, how we look at things. And he says in this, he says in verse 15 of chapter 3, he says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. So we should first have an attitude of a prepared heart. What is our heart? No, it's not just a thing that pumps the blood through our body. Biblically speaking, the heart includes that seat of consciousness, that center of values, intellect, emotions, and will. It's the center of who we are. And we should have a prepared heart. We should have a prepared heart. He says this, and how do we do it? He says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. It means to set Him aside, to make Him special. Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory, and He should reign in our lives. He should rule in our lives. And as we set Him aside, that's what we are to do. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And look what He says. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, or that could be better translated gentleness and respect. See, because when you begin to live like a sojourner, when you begin to live like a visitor or an alien, people are going to wonder about you. They're going to say, well, why don't you do the things the way we do them? Why don't you go to these movies? Why don't you listen to this music? How can you believe what you believe? Why do you take time to pray? Why do you spend time at church? Why, why, why? And they'll ask you all of these questions. And we need to be ready to give those answers. We need to be ready to defend those choices. And even more importantly, we need to be able to defend the message and truths of God. You know, this is the verse used by those who are involved in the study and discipline of apologetics. It doesn't mean we're to go out and apologize. Oh, I'm sorry about this. I'm sorry about that. No, no. The word apologia in the Greek means to make a defense. As a matter of fact, that is what a lawyer does when he or she is in the courtroom. They defend their client or they defend the case of the state. We are to be God's defense attorneys. We are to make sense to people of what we're trying to be and who we're trying to be. Because again, if you're going to live for Christ, if you're going to walk this journey in life as a sojourner and as an alien, you're going to get questions. You're going to get people who are wondering, why do you do this? Why do you go here? Why do you choose that? You need to be ready to tell them and give them answers. And give them answers from Scripture. Give them answers from truth. That's why we need to understand and we need to study all that we can about God. And not only that, but people are especially even now with the pandemic and everything going on. Why is God allowing this? That's the biggest question I've heard over the last several months. Or how about this? How can a good God 
allow all this evil to happen? How would you answer that? How can I believe in a God who you say is good but allows this pandemic to kill thousands of people? How can I believe in a God who is all-powerful and is all good and He doesn't stop this pandemic? Is He not powerful enough? How would you answer those questions? How would you, how would you defend God in that? Could you do that? If not, why? Well, we need to prepare our hearts. We need to make God so special and important in our life. He needs to be all-consuming in our lives. And then that would motivate us to know Him, to love Him, and to learn how to stand up for Him. And we do that with grace and love, by the way. Because understand this, you're not out to win an argument. The idea is to win a soul. But we need to nonetheless make sure that we're defending the Word of God and set him, setting Him apart in our hearts. But not only are we to have a prepared heart, but we're to also to have a pure mind. Look at verse 16 of chapter 3. He says, Doing this, we should have a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. You know, in our culture today, it's almost uh, becoming more difficult to be a Bible-believing, teaching Christian. Because if you stand for the morality and the moral teachings of Scripture, there are people in this world who will actually look at you and call you evil. Call you evil. Uh, one of the PBS science teachers uh, uh, would get on the program that he, that he hosted. And he would say, listen, teaching your children about creation is akin to child abuse. Isn't that amazing? Other people say if you believe in the biblical morality concerning human sexuality, well, you're just a bigot and you're a homophobe. Uh, if you teach someone that the Bible is the Word of God and to be obedient to that, while well, you're just oppressive and you're a racist. All of these things get laid at the feet of Christianity. But we need to make sure that we have a good conscience that when they do shame us as evildoers, they look at our lives and what, are we, what, what, what should we show them? Well, we should show them that we are living by what we say we believe. I'm going to tell you something. That's the biggest problem that the church has had over the last 50, 60, 70 years. We said that we believed one thing, but when we'd go home and try to live our lives, we'd live as though we never heard of it. You know, many of our young people who are coming up today you know, when they talk about church, they say, look, my mom and dad, they're one way at church, but when they go home, they act like they never went to church. Some people talk about all the traditions and all the trappings of, of church today. But they say, you know what, that's a bunch of hypocrisy. And I'm going to be honest with you. They're somewhat correct in that because many of us today who call ourselves believers aren't living lives in line with what we say we believe. And we're pushing people away rather than drawing them to Christ. So we need to make sure that if we say we believe the Word of God, we live it. We need to make sure that we say if we love the Lord of God, we live it. Love the Lord God, we live it. And so we need to make sure that we are living out the truths that we say we believe. He says in verse 17, For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer doing good than for doing evil. In other words, if you're going to suffer, and listen, you're going to suffer something in this world. Nobody gets out scot-free. Everybody has to deal with some kind of problem, some kind of issue. If I'm going to suffer, I'd rather suffer for doing good than doing something evil. I'd rather, if i got to go to prison, I'd rather go, rather go to prison for preaching the gospel than for stealing or for murdering or for harming somebody. And so, therefore, that's the attitude of the sojourner. We need to have a prepared heart where Christ is king and we are capable and ready to defend our choices and His truth. We also need to have a pure mind. In other words, we need to make sure that our life is integrated with our faith and vice versa. We need to quit living the hypocrisy of churchianity and we need to live the life of Christ as we say we do. Otherwise, keep your mouth shut and just move on. So that's the, soldier, or the sojourner's attitude. And finally, as we finish up, we're going to look at the sojourner's obligation. You know, we have an obligation. Knowing Christ, oh, I'm going to heaven. It's great. I'm wonderful. I love that. But you know what? Having Christ, knowing Christ, 
gives you and I a responsibility that we must fulfill. We have an obligation to fulfill as we go through this world, as sojourners. You know, when we went to Mexico, it was necessary for us to act correctly, to behave correctly, because we were representing the church of Jesus Christ for one thing. We didn't want to bring shame to God. But also as Americans, we were representing the United States of America. And we were told, listen, how you act will determine how these people think of the church and how they think of America. And we didn't want to bring any shame on either one of those parties. And so we had an obligation to live and to walk a certain way. And it's the same thing with the Christian sojourner. We have an obligation. Take your Bibles and go to chapter 5. We're going to skip down to chapter 5. Again, this is an overview, and we'll pack it up, pack it up, pick it apart later on. In chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 6, 7, and 8. We're going to look at the sojourner's obligation. Now, I want you to notice first in chapter 6, he says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. So what is our first obligation? It's to walk humbly. It's to walk humbly. You know, more often than not, Christians walk somewhat haughtily. We walk with our noses in the air and out of joint. And sometimes we look down at those sinners in the world. Oh, that person's a, a drug addict. That person's a, a wino. Or that person's, oh, this and they're that. And we just push down on them. And, oh, I would never be like them. Can I tell you a little secret? You are no better than anybody else in this world. You and I are no better than the guy in the street who is homeless. We are no, no worse than the person living in the mansion. We are no better than anybody else. When God looks at this world, He sees a world full of lost and sinful people. The only difference between believers and unbelievers is that we're saved sinners. We don't deserve that salvation. Salvation is not something we earn, something we should have because we're so great. Salvation is something we receive freely by accepting Jesus as our Savior. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I don't deserve to have God in my life. But I do because Jesus died on the cross, took the blame for my sin, past, present, and future, was buried and rose again from the dead. Forty plus years ago, I placed my faith in Him and I got saved. Again, I don't deserve it. I'm not any better or worse than anybody else. But I am saved and I'm obligated to walk humbly as someone who, yes, I don't deserve it. Now, what does humbly mean? What does it mean to walk humbly? Does it mean I walk around hangdog all the time saying, oh, I'm no good, I'm not talented, I'm not pretty? No, no, no. Being humble doesn't mean thinking low of yourself. Being humble means not thinking of yourself at all. You don't put yourself on any pedestal. People talk about self-esteem and self-respect. Listen, self-esteem is a lie. We need to have Christ esteem. Our lives need to be motivated by our esteem of Jesus. He needs to be our pride, our hope, our, our all those things. He needs to be all those things for us. So we should walk humbly and reach out a loving hand to, the, to anybody, to anybody, whoever they are, no matter their color, no matter their gender, no matter their belief system, no matter what's going on in their life. We need to reach out to them in love. Again, because they're God's image. So we should walk humbly. He says walk humbly. Not only that, but we are to worship fully. Worship fully. Look at verse 7. Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. I can be humble, and I don't have to worry about puffing up myself or being prideful in myself, because Jesus has done all for me, and Jesus offers me the riches of heaven. He's offered me His help. He's offered me His guidance, His illumination. He's given me His Spirit and gifted me for service. Therefore, I can cast all my care upon Him. And that's, that's what worship is all about. Worship is all about saying, Lord, here is my life. The good and the bad. The easy and the hard. I cast all my care upon You. When we gather to worship on Sunday mornings or we're gathering right now, our goal is not to have a great spiritual experience or to be entertained by the music and the preaching. Our goal should be to cast ourselves before the Lord so that He might get glory, so that He might gain glory. So casting all your care upon Him. 
all your problems, all your trials, yes, all your successes and triumphs, anything, you cast it upon Him. And you trust Him. So you walk humbly and you worship fully. And then verse 8, He says, be sober. In other words, be alert. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we're not only to, to just walk humbly or worship fully, we are to watch vigilantly. We are to watch vigilantly. We're to be alert and watchful in our lives. You know, how often do we let things slide? How often do we turn a blind eye to something? You know, I didn't see that homeless person or I didn't see that moral failure or I didn't see this problem in my life. I just turn a blind eye. No, no, no. We're we're to be alert. We're to be alert when we come in contact with people who need the gospel. We need to be alert as parents to the influences of our children. We're we're to be alert in our churches to make sure that, that Satan's influence doesn't get involved. We are to be watching vigilantly because, again, the devil, he is a roaring lion walking about looking for people that he might devour. And I've been in the ministry now for quite some time. And it's heartbreaking to say this, but I have seen many of my brothers and sisters in Christ fall by the wayside. I've seen them being devoured in a sense, not not in a tangible physical sense, but I've seen the world and, and the devil devour them, pull them out. And it's sad to see them step away from the Lord and step away from the truth because they weren't paying attention They allowed some sin to creep into their life. They allowed some indiscretion to creep into their life. And next thing you know, their life is ruined. I've had some brothers in the ministry that I loved and cherished. Their friendship and their brotherhood meant so much to me. But because of a moral failure or because of a a bad decision, they're no longer serving the Lord. They're no longer in the ministry. They're no longer even walking with Him out of the ministry. And it's heartbreaking. And we see that happen all the time. And so we need to make sure that we follow our obligation to walk humbly, to worship fully, and to watch vigilantly. So that's our obligation. That's what we're supposed to be about. So we've seen, first of all, in the book of 1 Peter, as we look at, look at the book of 1 Peter as a whole, <clears throat> we see the sojourner's reality. We're in the world but we're just not of the world. We're not to be like the world and its culture and its values. So that's our reality. We can either accept it or reject it. If you reject that reality, you're not going to make it. Because of that reality, the sojourner should have a new desire. We should desire the things of God, the goodness of God, the truth of God, the milk of His Word. And then as we grow, we should look to the meat of His Word to sustain us, to fill us, to to, to meet our desires. And we're to set aside all envy and boastfulness and malice and evil speaking and lying. We should set that aside. We should not argue on Facebook. We should not push our brothers and sisters around verbally. We should treat others with respect. That's what we're to renounce, all that negative stuff, and we're to receive the positive truth of God's Word. The sojourner's attitude should, have, should be a, one of a prepared heart. We should set God aside in His place. Set Him as King of our hearts. He should be ruling our lives and our value system. He should be the motivation of our lives. He should be the the thing that we use to make our choices. We're to have a prepared heart and we're to have a pure mind. In other words, we are not to be the hypocrites. If we say we believe, then let's live like we believe. And yes, sometimes that's sacrificial. Yes, sometimes that's inconvenient. And sometimes it is downright difficult. But we need to live with that pure heart, that pure mind, and that conscience. The soldier's, uh, sojourner's obligation is to walk humbly, to worship fully, and to watch vigilantly, to make sure that we are living right before the Lord God Almighty. GotQuestions.org, a great website, especially if you're going to be defending the faith, says this says, so the Christian life is one lived by faith in the God who saved us. He empowers us, seals us for heaven, 
and by whose power we are kept forever. Again, that's the reality. It's living by faith, complete trust in God. It goes on to say the day-to-day life of faith is one that grows and strengthens as we seek God in His Word and through prayer as we unite with one another and other Christians whose goal of Christ-likeness is similar to our own. In other words, we're to do this together. We're to walk together. Yes, the pandemic is keeping us from worshiping collectively. We hope to get back together again uh, in the next couple of Sundays. We'll be announcing that, so pay attention. Be looking for that announcement. We're to gather together. We're to encourage one another. And our goal is to live Christ-like lives, and we're to encourage each other in that. But that's what the journey is. It's to be more Christ-like, and it's a process. It takes time. So as we finish this morning, I want to leave you with a passage from the book of Philippians. We studied that a few months ago. And here's the journey again. Philippians 3 and verse 14. This was again Paul. And he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That is our goal. That is our journey. It's not how much money we should make. It's not how much celebrity we should have. It's not how big our house or how, how, how pretty our family is. Our goal in life, our goal for our journey is to press on, press toward the mark of God, the prize of that high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. Again, do you know Christ Jesus? Do you know Him as your Savior? I pray that you've trusted Him. I pray that you know Him. Again, as I said before, when we're talking about walking humbly, I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve Christ. But His death on the cross bought and paid for heaven for me and for you. He didn't do that because we deserved it. He did that because we didn't deserve it, but He loved us nonetheless. He was buried three days later after He was crucified, rose again from the dead, and He offers salvation to all who would come to Him by faith. You come to Him and admit you're a sinner. You come to Him him and admit your sin. And then you place your full faith and confidence in Him. But if you know Jesus, are you willing to walk on this journey? Are you willing to be a sojourner? Stop making your home in this world. It's not going to be your home in a few decades anyway. We're either going to be trumpeted out or we're going to be, we're going to die and we're going to go to be with Him. This is temporary. Eternity is coming. We'll spend eternity with God. So that should determine what our journey should be like. We're just visitors here. We need to impact this world for Christ. And as we long for home, we need to reflect Christ in all that we do. So as we we go through 1 Peter, we're going to look at each one of these different themes. We're going to break it down. And God willing, we're going to learn how we are to go on this journey as sojourners using His handbook to help us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for this time together. We thank You, Lord, that we can open Your Word and that, Lord, even when life is as difficult as it is now and we can't understand it, we can't figure it out, Lord, we're struggling, we're hurting, Father, You provide answers. You provide guidance. Lord, You will bring us through all of this one way or another. Father, help us, instead of focusing on the rocks in the road, help us to to grab Your guidebook, the Word that You've given us, Father, and help us to live our journey that way. Help us to get excited about our spiritual journey, our transformative journey. Father, help us on our journey to make it our goal to give You honor and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, if we focus on that, if we're we're zeroed in on that, Father, all this other stuff will fade away. And Father, we will find hope in life. We will find purpose in life. And Father, we will find that excitement that we need so bad. Guide us as we are sojourners for you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you all. We'll see you next time. Take care.